Hi, I'm Ulrike, uh, and I've been working with testing for quite some time. And I started with testing because uh, when I was studying at KTH, all my friends, which previously had worked with programming, always said that they will never, ever, ever work with testing. It's the most boring thing in the entire world, and they will never, ever do it. And for some reason, that sparked my interest. Uh, and so I was curious, how can it be? Can it really be that boring? And it seems kind of important. So is it really? And I tried it out, and it turns out that I really love it. I really love the detective work of testing, of sort of seeing something a bit fishy and then trying to figure out what was it really, what was going on, and what is it, and why is it this way, and all of those things. And I really found a lot of fun in it. And the reason why I want to give this presentation is because I have noticed that uh, there are a lot of programmers who don't know much about testing. And there are some programmers who know a lot about testing. And I can tell that the ones who are really excellent programmers, the ones whose code I get with no, absolutely no bugs and it's really, really hard to find one, they are the ones who actually know a bit about testing and understand what it is and what it isn't. And so I'm going to talk a bit about testing, and I'm going to try to bust some myths about testing for you. And the first, um, first thing I do want to talk about is Madden, which is the company I work for. And we do this awesome TV streaming service, uh, and we're like just a couple of blocks away. Um, it's a really great company. It's a lot of fun, um, and you should know that. You should, seriously. All right. So I'm going to jump right into this. Um, have you heard this statement before? Testing increases quality. It's a pretty common statement, right? The only problem is that it's false. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so testing in itself doesn't really have anything to do with quality. What testing does is that you perform some, some testing on a system, and from that, you will get information. So when you are testing something and you input something into a system, you get an output. And what that is, is information. And information isn't really valuable unless you're actually acting upon it. So I want to sort of illustrate this with, it, with an example. So this is the mess, right? Sorry. So let's say that you have a bunch of spaghetti code. And you add some testing. What do you get? Well, you still have your spaghetti code, but you also have 165 bug reports in Jira. Does that mean that you have better quality? No. So people usually say that testers will break stuff. And that's not true. Testers don't break stuff. They only find that something already is broken. So what they will do is that they will input stuff and then they realize that, hey, there's a problem here. But they're not actually breaking anything. It's just that's the way it is, and that's the way it started out. Customer, I don't really care if there are 100 reports in For me, I only care about is it working? Can I do the things which I want to do? So they're actually they're worthless in themselves. So testers don't things, and quality doesn't magically appear just because you have testers or just because you do testing. It's something that you have to think about and which you actually, some people say that you need to build quality in. Um, and so that's sort of the spirit of it, to, to think about the fact that if you want there to be quality, you have to think about it to begin with. You can't just expect testers to come in and magically make it happen. A lot of companies will hire testers and sort of expect quality to go up and uh, doesn't really work that way. What you do is you get a lot bunch more information. Um, there is this saying that a metric isn't, how is it again? So if you measure something, what you are measuring, the value of that is not in the measurement in itself, but it's the value of the decision it informs. So if you can make something good, a good decision based on this measurement, then it's, then it's a valuable measurement. But if you can't take any decisions on it, then there's no point in actually measuring that thing. And it's sort of the same with testing and, and bugs. Right, so you need to build it in. Right, I'm oh, sorry, I should have studied my slide deck a bit more. Oh. <laughs> That's the 
danger of changing it a bit too, um, too closely to when you do the talk. All right. So testing basically is information, and that's what I want you to remember. That testing is just not about quality, it's about gathering information. And what you do with it is what matters, if you do something good or not. So I want you to think about quality while you're developing. This means that since you will now learn that it doesn't matter if you test, it doesn't help you to bring in quality, you need to think about it earlier. And by trying to think of things which can happen before you're actually programming or before you're actually implementing something, means that it never actually gets into JIRA, it never becomes a bug at all. So if you have a tester on your team, use that person to try to help you think of things, even before the fact. Or if you don't, then I'm going to teach you some techniques you can use to, um, to think about this. So right, here's another statement. Programmers can test their own code. Have you heard this one? So I have a feeling that this probably originated from, from testers, that they were the ones who, who started saying this. I believe that probably they thought it was a good way to justify the fact that they were important, that they had a job to do, that of course no one can test the code as well as I do. It would be very dangerous to let something into production if a tester hasn't looked at it. Uh, obviously. Um, but I've also heard programmers repeat this. I can't test my own code, or programmers can't test their own code. And I hear people saying like, well programmers, they can't test their own code because they can only see the nice happy path and the straight road and they can never imagine that there could be a problem or something. Or programmers, they can't test their own code because when you, did, when you created a solution, you can't stop thinking about the way that you have created a solution. You can't broaden your perspective and think of other things. And I get really upset when I hear people say this because I feel it's really disrespectful to other human beings. Um, these are competent people that you're talking about, people who are experts in the craft. Of course, they can test their own code. Maybe they're not so used to it. Maybe they haven't learned how. But of course, they can. And I think that's really important to, to realize that it is a question about learning to change your perspective, learning to think about, well, what could happen, taking some time and focusing on those things, or asking a friend, can you help me out? Can you give me some examples of stuff I haven't thought about? And you can do it. And there are lots of teams who work without testers and obviously release their own code, and, and no one is dying for it. I, I mean, I shouldn't make that statement. But <laughs> Well, you get my point. So it's a question about responsibility. Do you want to take responsibility for the things that you're creating? Or do you want to have, let someone else take responsibility for the things you're creating? And I worked with programmers who have, I remember once when I, they released to QA, uh, which means that for them it was like, I'm done uh, with this. I can start with my new work, new story. It doesn't really matter. And I get the application, and I try to start it, and it doesn't even start. And I feel that is very disrespectful towards me, because it's wasting my time. You could at least have started your application. And I'm hoping you don't do that. <laughs> uh, but that's like the basic level of sanity for some, some way. So this is a myth. By the way, if you have any questions or remarks, uh, please interrupt whenever. Um, we're not so many in the room, so it's just nice to have a dialogue about things. And I promise I'll repeat the questions. So let's move into what testing is. We talked about what testing isn't. It isn't quality in itself. And I want to clear up some confusion which can happen. So let's say that we have a calculator, and this is a screenshot from from Google's calculator in the browser. Um, what kind of tests would you do to test this calculator? And it's not a true question. All answers are good answers. <laughs> See if the, the input field works and you can uh, enter everything. See if the input field works and you can enter anything? Test each function and combinations of functions. Test each function and combination of functions. So much. Like, uh, divisions of 
some uh, <coughs> operations that shouldn't be allowed. Some divisions and some operations which yeah. shouldn't be allowed, yeah. Is that, that the maximum number of digits and stuff like that? Can you enter? What happens if I enter text? And stuff? Uh, maximum number of digits and what happens if I enter text? <coughs> but, but what he said. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm repeating everything because we're recording this, so it goes uh, into the mic. Random, just tapping, monkey style. Yeah. The cat from the first slide. The cat from the first slide, yeah. Bring in a cat and do some testing on the, on the keyboard. Yeah. All right, these are all excellent suggestions and, and very valid tests to test the calculator. So there is a difference between some of these uh, suggestions which you have. So uh, some tests which you want to do are very objective. Some tests are very much they have an answer, a clear answer. It's a black and white answer. If I, if I test a function, uh, if I enter this plus that, will it give me the right correct answer? It's very easy to know. If you're doing something which is maybe not allowed, um, what you want to see is, does it have a, a good message for me? Do I understand that if I try to divide by zero, what does it say? Does it say something which makes sense or does it just like crash? What happens? You, know, you want to know something about that. So the first part is those tests which are uh, sort of predictable, which have a right answer. It's black and white, or it's red or green, whatever you feel like. They're very discreet. Uh, they're very, you know the answer to these. And we usually, some people like to call these checks because we want to make a differentiation between those things which are easy to know the answer to and the things which are difficult to know the answer to. So when I talk about testing, it happens that some people will say, well, yeah, I have lots of unit tests. And unit tests are an excellent example of this. It's very predictable. You know exactly what the answer is going to be. If it's, if it's OK, it's going to be green. If it's not OK, it's going to be red. It's totally exact, um, totally fits these criteria. And these are excellent things for a computer to do. It's integration tests. It's automated testing, all those things, which a computer is excellent at doing. But then you have. The other stuff, so here you suddenly have text in the middle of it. Is that okay for a release? Maybe not. Maybe you feel like this looks a bit unserious. We wouldn't like to have a big line of text in the middle of the calculator. It doesn't make any sense. But could you find an automated test to capture this? Yeah. Possibly, yeah, you can. But it's much more difficult than it is uh, to find the other ones. And this might be a silly example, but it's the kind of things which actually might want to have a human to look at to say that there isn't going to be any text on this, or this looks silly. Or it can be the fact that if you enter something and the calculation takes a long time, maybe it's a good thing to throw up a spinner because then the human knows that something is actually happening and they're just not waiting for anything. And those are the kind of things that you actually need the human to realize. And also, you could put like a response time. But we all know that depending on how you're treating a wait period, uh, people will see it as either a short wait or a long wait, depending on if you do a spinner, if you don't do a spinner, or whatever you can imagine to if you load parts of the page or whatever. So there are things, ways to trick a human, uh, which the computer doesn't really catch. So we want to talk about these as exploration as the things where there isn't an expected answer. You don't really know what's going to happen. When you do exploration, you're often, learn, often learning stuff about the application you're working with. And you're maybe investigating it. You're trying different options, and you're learning about the application. And you're seeing unusual stuff. It can also be the process of modeling what should happen. That is also a support, uh, way of exploring. And the reason why I want to bring this up to you is because I had these conversations where I talked to someone, what does your testing strategy look like? Well, we have a unit test and we have integration tests. Okay, but that for me isn't, isn't testing. It isn't about exploration. It isn't about trying different things. It's about the checking part of it. You're missing an entire array of things you could do because you're seeing testing equals checking. And that could be okay for your strategy. It's just that we need to know that there is a difference so that we can actually have a conversation about it and so that we're not misunderstanding each other. And those misunderstandings are sometimes really difficult to, to set straight. Um, because the checks have, 
they're there for one purpose, and the exploration is there for another purpose. So how, trying to equal those means that it can be difficult to have that conversation. Any comments about this? I mean, obviously, I mean, certainly if you have a backend system, then probably uh, the checks will surface. But it's a more kind of user interface. Uh, the more user interface you have, the more important it is to have explorative uh, So the question is, if you have a backend system, maybe the checks are, are enough. But if you have something with a lot, lot more user interface, then maybe it's... Yeah, more of a, 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 a rambling, uh, throwing something there. Yeah, the possible. <laughs> so um, I'm going to answer your question a little later. Okay. Um, I'll see that. So this is check and explore. And if you're interested in, in actually reading some, when some really smart people <laughs> are writing about this and explaining it properly, then you should go to this link. Um, Elizabeth Hendrickson is a big uh, hero of mine. She's amazing. She's written a book called uh, Explore It, which is a tiny book on exploratory testing, but she's, she's packed with lots of tips. I really recommend it. And she says that for something to be tested, it has to be both checked and explored. So you want to verify that the things you are expecting to happen will happen, but you also have to look at the broader picture and see are there any unexpected things going on here. And there is the book, Explore It. So I want to show you a movie. And I want you to, to watch this movie in, in silence. You might have seen something similar before. But even if you have, just please follow the instructions. It's going to be much more fun if you do that, OK? And the sound doesn't matter. Anyone get it right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> How could you miss that? Seriously. <laughs> So what does this say about testing? It's hard. It's hard? <laughs> <laughs> so you missed the number of passes, but you also missed the bear. <laughs> yeah. so focus on the bear. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know? It's easy to see what you're looking for. It's easy to see what you're looking for? I feel that this is sort of, it reminds me a lot of when we're doing software engineering and we're, someone gave us a problem to solve. And we're really good at solving the problem. We're just doing that. We could write checks for it, trying to see how many passes the team does and we could verify that it's actually 13 and everything is nice and, and lovely. But who thinks of like, hey, maybe we should write a check so that there's no beers passing by our application. <laughs> it doesn't really happen. Um, but there are always, those, those bears, they're always there. And I heard a story once of, it was a company which made um, pharmaceutical uh, things. And they had an application, and of course, since it's pharmaceutical, they tested it like in and out and everything, and really, really properly tested everything. And then they got in a, a summer intern. Uh, and the first thing that the summer intern did was he accidentally clicked beside the button, and the application completely crashed because no one had ever clicked beside a button before. Uh, and that is sort of my best bear story. And if you have a bear story, please come and share them. I really love those. I collect those. Um, those things which are completely unexpected. You never actually thought that you should check for this. Um, and that's what I believe testing is for, to try to figure out what are those bears which are passing through our application. And that's when I come back to your question, Peter, about the backend systems. I think it's possible that we have those in backend systems as well, that there are those sort of completely unexpected things that when you hook up this and this and 
just whatever. It's the only data doesn't mean that you have to uh, arrive. Yeah, I guess. Just because it's only data doesn't mean that you that there isn't a possibility that something can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So so there's possibly always a bear, and there there are ideas that maybe you can see what happens if you suddenly pull the plug on something, or if you do. I don't know. So there's probably something you can think of with a backend system, which also makes sense to test. So that's a good. This I stole from Elizabeth Hendrickson as well. Um, the video. Um, yeah, you have a question. Uh, and then there's also the whole area of penetration testing. Penetration testing. Which, uh, usually happens on backend systems. Yeah, yeah. So penetration testing of backend systems is a good area. Yeah. I had I talked to Don Bergunson once, and he started explaining to me that, well, when you talk, think about hackers, they're actually a, a lot behaving like exploratory testers. They will try something, and they will get a clue, and then they will find something else, and they will get a clue. And that's a bit of what you do when you do exploratory testing as well. So where in the specs does it say that there's no bear? We need the antimoon wolf. <laughs> exactly, but that will only test for that, and then there's a goose passing by, and you must do goose, you know, and then there are ducks. So go out and find your moonwalking bears is my my invitation to you. Here's another statement: testers' work begins when the code is written. Now, I guess from now you learn what my statements are. <laughs> so, of course, this is also a myth. There's a lot of things which a tester does. Uh, prior to any code being written, or a good tester at least. And that's about testing assumptions that you have even before you start working on anything. It's about asking a lot of what if questions. What if connection goes down? What if we change the language? What if we do this? And sometimes if you're working with a, testers and a tester, and maybe if it's a good one, you'll think that this person is really stupid because that person is asking all of these questions and every time it's the same question, what about the language and what about this? And hey, couldn't this happen? It looks really off. But usually in those conversations and when you keep the conversation going, they will find, you will suddenly think of, hey, wait a minute, not the language, but if we change the version, that would make a difference. So asking all of those questions will probably trigger a thought of something which can actually be a problem. And I feel that seeing the big picture is something which is very important if you want to think of quality. Who is actually going to use this? In which situations are they going to use this? And all of those aspects. Hello. Why isn't it shaking? There. Did I switch a lot of pictures in between? Well, no, uh, well, that was weird. It was just blank, wasn't it? <laughs> right. I have this theory that there are three perspectives to quality. And the first perspective is communication. So depending on how you're communicating in your team um, or with stakeholders or whoever, that will, impact that will impact quality. So if you're working in a team where you have one person which is very outspoken and very strong-willed, possibly the other team members will feel uh, that it's difficult to bring up potential problems or that it's difficult to say that, hang on, maybe this isn't the best solution. And that will actually impact quality, just like basically in just that communication, it can impact quality. Or if you have a poor communication with the stakeholder and you actually never hear them say that, no, that's not what I meant, uh, or this is what I want instead, that will impact quality. You'll have those big misunderstandings from the beginning. The other part which perspective which I find is the ways of working. So how are you slicing up work which you have on the table? To make a very simplistic example, if you, if you get a bunch of work and you say, let's start with a database and then let's do a controller and then let's do a view. Uh, as a tester, I usually ask, well, why can I get something to test? And people will say, no, you have to wait three sprints because in the first sprint we're doing the database and well, that's not for you, it's not, there's no GUI. And then we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do that. And, after three sprints, you might have something you can actually test. Do you really want to wait that long for feedback? Or can you find some way of slicing this, which is, let's do this user flow to begin with. It goes from database to, to view, and we can test that, and we can see what happens with that flow, and then we can add some other things. That is one thing. And also, what happens in your stand-ups? Is the right information coming up in your stand-ups, or are you missing stuff there? 
and stuff falling in between the chairs, which you don't say in English, which is really fun. Okay. Uh, third one is techniques, and that is actually how do you spot problems? And that can be monitoring. Can you tell that in production stuff is not working the way it is? Or it can be before you're releasing, can you see that there's a problem with this code or this function? I want to show you one technique which has to do with ways of working, or two techniques which have to do with ways of working. The first is a user story map. Who has heard of user story mapping? A few people. This is a thing which, after learning about this, I do not understand how I ever managed to slice up work before. It's like it's the before and after, and I don't even understand how it happened before. Wait, I was lying. I, I don't you don't have that. <laughs> so user story mapping is a technique which Jeff Patton describes very well. It has to do with how you slice up work, and you start with the user journey uh, as the backbone, which is the blue things here. And then you start adding things which you have to do to be able to make that user journey come through. And those are the yellow notes. And the amazing part about this is that you can then prioritize and find a slice of work which you can actually start doing. So in this case, we have payments either by PayPal or by card. Maybe in our first iteration, we only do PayPal. Uh, and that's good enough for a first release. And then in our next release, we can start adding card payments. So it's really great that it focuses on the user, on the user journey, uh, which gives you that broad picture, the full picture which I talked about before. And it's also a nice tool to help you prioritize stuff. So your, your product owner is going to love this. Um, it's amazing. Could, yes. could you share the slides? With the I will share the slides. Okay. The other one is uh, uh, BDD scenarios, like examples, which is a nice way of capturing uh, ideas. And usually when they're actually give an example, someone will say, no, no, that's not exactly it. I meant like this. Or, yeah, yeah, that's true, except for when. And finding those things really early is excellent. To boost those, you can draw them. You can draw like these pictures. So here uh, is our magic user, the magic pack at Magin. We can see that there's a, uh, a wizard hat and a wand and a beard. And this is our max user with the burger. <laughs> see? So, and what I found is that when you're drawing these things, it's much more fun than writing the given one than BDD style things. It takes less space, uh, which means that you have more space on your whiteboard. Um, it triggers more creativity because you're drawing things. And you're actually laughing at my drawings in this case. Uh, and you're having fun together. So if you're going to do BDD, why not just draw stick figures and stuff to illustrate your examples? Here is another technique which is doing a mind map. And we did this mind map when we were going to do a release. and. One member in the team said, hang on, I have, I have a bad feeling about this. Um, how is this really going to go? And so we asked him, well, what's the problem? Well, there's so many things. I just, I can get an overview. I, I don't understand how we really covered everything. Can we be sure that this is going to feel good to release or not? And so we decided to draw this mind map together. And here we have, it's for a purchase flow, maybe you call it. So you, you can purchase uh, tickets in this case. And the nodes are different views in the flow. And then you have like, what can you vary to in those things? So if you have like, um, you enter your personal details, what can you do? You can enter phone numbers or names and whatever you can do. And we decided to make a copy of this. We had it in a conference room first. We decided to make a copy of it and bring it down to our desks so that this was sitting just next to us. And we could just look up and see, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, and we also have the yellow stickers for the things we have automated uh, to have an overview of what's our confidence level on these things. So mind maps are really good. Here's the mind map in drawn into a computer, just if you're interested in what the nodes could look like. Um, and also with the checks is the automation of it. So that's mind map, by the way. A mind map. What do you call it? Enthusiast, nerd? All right. So my tips here is to use those mind maps, for example, to explore things together, to find the whole, to see the whole picture, to see what's going on, and try to not misunderstand each other too much. Uh, and you have lots of different perspectives in your teams. So use those uh, to your advantage and find things which could be problematic and find information. 
and this is a general rule, always be different. I find that sometimes I feel when I'm testing, I feel like, whoa, I was lucky to find this bug. Uh, I really, I, sh I used F5 this time to go to this menu option. I usually click, but well, how lucky I am. And then I realized, no, I'm not lucky. I have, I make, I have a deliberate way of doing things, which is to always try to find another path. If there are two ways to get into a view, switch in between them. If you have supporting different browsers, always use another one. If you are, uh, have op different operating systems, try to use a virtual machine or something. Do things differently and try to make that a deliberate thing. Don't just use the same old browser and enter the same username. And how many have like test tests on at test suite one, two, three, one, 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 two, yeah. Testville. Yeah. So create your own luck, be different, do different things. And here's a gift to you to be able to do things differently, and that's bug magnet, which is a Chrome extension. So here you see that there are different options. If you're going to enter a name, it helps you to enter different kind of names. Um, and Chinese signs and whatever, and null, and all those things which, you, uh, which are useful. So if you do one thing after this presentation, just install bug magnet and, and use that when you're inputting stuff into fields. Uh, it's probably going to help you, save you some time. There are also checklists online which you can use. So here you have Elizabeth again with, like, if you're entering a string, what should you think of? Or you can make your own checklist for your application with things which always mess up your releases or whatever. There's another technique called San Francisco Depot, which is a, a mnemonic, is that how you say it? Mnemonic, something like that. Uh, and a heuristic, so heuristic is a rule of thumb. Uh, and you, it's called San Francisco Depot so that you'll remember it easily. And the rule of thumb is really good in testing because it's usually a good way to, to structure your testing. Um, and that's the definition of mnemonic and the rule of thumb. So it helps you think of different perspectives of an application. For example, or in this case, it stands for structure, function, data, platform, operation, and time. And the idea is that if you're always looking at these six perspectives uh, of, of something, you will probably catch most things because it's usually good enough to do that. Um, so if you don't know where to start when you're testing something, you have no idea where to begin. Um, it could be a good idea to start with these perspectives. And structure is basically what it's made of. For me, it's more like the physical com composition of a program, which is really weird because it's not actually physically there, but it, well, yeah, it is, but still. So does it have files? Is it on a server? Where, where is it running or those kind of things? And function, what, what is it actually doing? Or does it have any error handling and those kind of things? Data is obviously what it processes. It can be the user who's inputting something. It can be that it's reading something from another system. Uh, it can be different kinds of aspects of data. Platform is what devices is it running on? Are there any third party libraries or connection or whatever? Does the platform say? Operations is how will it actually be used? Who is going to use this and what are you going to do with it? This is usually the part which like branches out. I'm guessing. <laughs> and then finally we have time. And time can either be um, like, it, does it time out in this some cases? Or can it be if I'm like really fast at doing this, what, what happened then? Um, are time zones a problem? They usually are. And those kind of things, in my experience. Yes? Can I ask a question about time? Hmm? Uh, a question about time. So the question is, does, does, how does it impact, or is age of something you can use with time? So now you're showing me why, why that thing is good, mm -hmm. because it triggers a thought in you. It triggers the idea that, hey, hang on, maybe age is an issue in our application. So that's sort of the reason why you do this, when you do this exercise, to see that, who maybe this is something we should test. And I think that would be appropriate to, to add that into time. So what happens after a couple of years when when someone has grown up, is it okay still, or what happens? And I think we're, as mostly young people, we're sort of forgetting that stuff happens in life. 
Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> age can be a factor. I just want to say that when you are testing, so this is sort of an idea to have, or a general tip is to just take some time and sit down and turn off notifications and your chat or whatever and just spend like 15 or 30 minutes just sit down and think of all the things you can come up with and actually try those out. It doesn't have to take longer than that to get a few good ideas and a few uh, and a bit of information. So I think just spending 15 minutes uninterrupted is much better than not spending any time at all. Um, but do it focused and I think this is a misconception that people have about testers that when you're doing exploratory testing you're just like clicking away a bit and a bit of that and just like randomly but not really. When we do exploratory testing we take one of those maybe San Francisco nodes and we actually spend time on doing just that for a certain amount of time and we focus on it. There's a lot of focus in exploratory testing. It's I'm going to try what, this ha what happens with this for a while. So spend time focusing. So the summary is basically to realize that you can't test call it in, you have to build it in, to realize that you're fully capable of doing testing yourselves. Uh, I hope that I showed you a few techniques which might help you to do that. Um, think of the fact that checks aren't everything. There's more to it. Uh, they're an important part, but there is something else out there. And just a reminder of find those bears. Right. That's it. Thank you very much, Erika.